Okay, everybody. Hey, welcome back. Good afternoon. It's uh, Tuesday, February the 9th, and it's 12.39 p.m., so we have about six minutes until class time, and then I'll get our lecture underway. But uh, for now, appreciate you guys for being here, and thanks for your continued attendance. And we will just uh, get comfortable, get ready to learn, and dive right in in just a few. So welcome, hope you had a great weekend. Okay, just around four minutes until class. I like to just arrive a few minutes early, set up the stream in case anybody um, gets to the meeting a few moments before class time. So anyway, see a couple of us here. <sighs> and just a few minutes. No rush, about three minutes. Welcome everybody that's showing up. <clears throat> Just hanging in there until 12.45. Hey there, Devin. Good to see you. <clears throat> okay, just a couple moments before we get started. Hi, Ariana. Good to see you again. <clears throat> Hi, Anthony. Hope you're having a good one. Hi, Amber. Hey there. <clears throat> uh, 
is you, you well is it a different name there Aramaki um, yeah if you have a name that's on the roster that differs from that then just go ahead and mention it if your screen name is the same as your name like Austin then you don't need to just write your name you could just say hi or whatever <clears throat> okay <clears throat> Hi there, Alina, Amber, everybody else. All, all good to see you guys. Okay, we're coming close now to the time. Good. Nice to see you then, Prue. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. I can see that it's now uh, pretty much 1245, so I'm going to let our class get started and get underway. Um, thanks again for your attendance and for just being here and uh, making the meeting. I hope all of you guys had a good weekend. I know it was the Super Bowl weekend, so maybe some of you got to catch the game on Sunday. Um, I mean, in a way, it was probably not the most competitive of all uh, Super Bowl competitions that we've seen. You know, it wasn't really close, but it's always kind of fun just to see the game and the, you know, halftime show and whatever else. Um, Peachy says hello, so checking in over here. Good girl. Um, and so, yeah, let me remind anybody here that if you're in the meeting and you're watching right now, uh, please do just mark off your attendance by putting a comment in the live chat. Um, you can say hi, hello, or just whatever you want. But um, as I was mentioning just a moment ago, if you're using a screen name that's different from your name on the class roster, then uh, make a note about the name. Uh, yeah, no, I, I see you there, Paul, not to worry. And uh, good to see you. And I, I got your message. I, I sent you your reply too. So I appreciated your your kind message. Okay. So good. Happy to see everybody here. Let's just kind of resume where we left off last time. So the first thing I want to do is kind of just review some of the material from the previous lectures. And uh, with your guys' help, we'll just kind of cover some of that material again. Then we'll press on, and I'm gonna deepen your understanding of argument a little bit by uh, helping you to comprehend the difference between deductive and inductive arguments and deductive and inductive reasoning. So that's the main goal of today's meeting, but let's first review. So um, last Thursday was our first real lecture in the semester, and we all kind of just began the discussion by talking about what is a good or a bad critical thinker. So anyone here that has the memory or the notes or both, let me know if you can put in the chat, what do you think is a good critical thinker? What overall kind of description is it to say that someone is a good critical thinker? Let me see what you think on that, and then that'll be our, we'll jump off from there. <clears throat> so yeah, let's see, what do you think? Good critical thinkers of the world, who are they? What are they like? What is the defining characteristics of such a person? Okay, good, Devin. So it's a person that would not believe a claim unless it's based on a good argument or good evidence, I think, right? And Second, and that's also good proof, is the kind of person that can back up their own claims with evidence and arguments. So, yeah, it's a two-way street. When you're the one hearing information, you need to see that it's based on some kind of credible argument or evidence before you would accept that it's true. And if you are a person making a claim to another person, then you would try to always make sure to provide good reasons or evidence, arguments to back your own views up. Bad critical thinker would be... Uh, the reverse. That would be the sort of person that does believe things without good reasons or without good arguments. So they'll just believe things for no good reason. And then a bad critical thinker also doesn't have the ability to provide good reasons and arguments to defend their positions to other people. Preston, you say uh, belief of a claim based on good argument or good evidence. Yeah, well, that's, that's what good critical thinkers do. They will believe such claims only that are based on good arguments and evidence. Okay, good. And so we just talked about like Different examples of people and kinds of people that could fit these descriptions, like um, lawyers, scientists, uh, academics, um, professionals in various fields that have to make precise judgments, like doctors. These would be good critical thinkers uh, because they come with arguments and evidence when they give some kind of reasoned point of view. And um, we also talked about examples of bad critical thinkers. I don't know, um, very small children. Um, those that follow tabloid journalism, maybe conspiracy theorists, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, cult members and stuff. 
So we said that our goal in this class is to try and become better critical thinkers rather than worse. We want to try and go towards the standard of a good critical thinker. After that, we all talked about what arguments are. Okay, so Peachy, come on now. She's like really being a <coughs> lovey-dovey this morning, so she's all over me, but I'll, I'll move her if I need to at some point. But right now, I'm just reviewing, so it's okay. Um, next thing we talked about is arguments. So good critical thinkers are good at presenting arguments and also evaluating incoming arguments to see whether they're good or bad. So let's mention again, what is an argument in the sort of formal sense as described by logic? Um, it's a set of certain things, but how many and what are they and all that? So tell me, what's the definition of an argument? <clears throat> An argument. What is that? So just taking a little tour of the information from Thursday last week so that we're all on the same page again. Okay, Devin, so it is a set of two or more sentences where one of the sentences is the conclusion and all of the other sentences are premises. Okay, exactly. Well, one thing you say at the end, though, is not correct, but it's just a slight error. At the bottom, you say an argument requires one premise and one conclusion. Almost. It requires one conclusion and at least one premise. So you can have more than one premise. It's not that it has to have exactly only one. Um, you know, many arguments contain two, three, four, however many premises. But yeah, every argument is a combination of sentences where there's more than one because you have a conclusion and then at a minimum, one premise. Now, um, like in the case written, the argument here, <clears throat> Like, say, for example, my car is parked on the street. This morning, my car was wet. So therefore, it rained last night. I'm just giving like a random example here of a possible argument just off the top of my head. But Kayla, it's also not necessarily that it's only two. I mean, it's just at least one. It's the way of thinking about it is it's greater than or equal to one premise. So you can have two, three, four, it can be one. It just cannot be zero, that's all. In this case, there are two though, true enough. So, um, and now Paul, you give another example. My car is parked on the street. Today is street sweeping day, therefore I should move my car, yeah. So if that's the conclusion that I should move my car, it's based on a couple of pieces of evidence statements that you give as premises. In this case, I'm using these two statements as evidence towards this conclusion. The conclusion I'm trying to establish is that it rained last night. Why would I say this? Well, because, for example, one thing is my car is parked on the street and it was wet this morning. So therefore, I conclude that it rained last night. Okay, so in any ways, um, it is kind of, uh, yeah, it's it is street sweeping day for some of us, so you might want to be careful about that. But nonetheless, guys, this is just an example of an argument. Now, what's the conclusion of this argument? It's the statement that is at the bottom. And that's something also important to remember. When we write out arguments in logic, we write them in what's called standard form. And so when you have a standard form argument, the conclusion is placed at the below, at the bottom. This horizontal line serves as a divider between the one conclusion and the premises. The premises are listed above this line and um, they have to occur on separate ledgers, so they cannot be on one continuous line. By numbering them, it helps us to remind that they're supposed to be listed vertically like so. Okay, now, um, I have a question. What's the definition of these terms, conclusion and premise? Let's go into that for a moment. The conclusion of the argument is the statement or the sentence that you're trying to, to what? Let me know about that. <clears throat> Let me just know. Yeah, so you're trying to prove it. And uh, to be even more precise, it's to be proven true. You're trying to prove or show that the conclusion is true, that it's something that's true. The premises now, well, no, Anthony, let's not mistaken the word valid. Hold off on the thought of validity. That's something that we will talk about today. Um, validity, I've not yet introduced. Validity is a concept that pertains to whole arguments, not just for one statement in the argument, like the conclusion or the premise. But fair enough, we're trying to prove the conclusion to be true, exactly. Question again, 
about the definition of premises. What are premises of an argument? The premises are the sentences, the information that you're giving as what? How do they relate to the conclusion? What's their role? Premises are, uh, uh, are stated in order to what? It's evidence to support the conclusion. Yes, that's right. Um, now, Paul, I don't know why you keep talking about the irrelevance that you think you see in premise one of this example here. It is relevant. The claim that it rained last night in this case is being justified by two facts that your car is outside, so if it's going to rain, then water would appear on it because it's not parked in a garage. So anyway, yeah, it rained last night is a reasonable inference to draw from these premises, but I digress. So the premises are evidence to support the conclusion. Um, it's funny, no, anyway, the car being on the street didn't contribute to the rain or proof of the rain. No, but you, I mean, clearly you could uh, reason that rain happened in case you have a car parked outside, which is wet in the morning. I mean, it could have been a sprinkler. It could have been someone with a water gun, but it still counts as an argument. Whether it's valid or not is something that we can discuss as we learn the terminology, what validity is. But anyway, an argument. So as I go back to our review, the point of arguments is to show that the conclusion is true. So a new question, what does the word truth mean? What does it mean when a sentence is true? Let me hear about that. What does it mean when a sentence is true? Let's just see if we can uh, get that piece of information on the table again. To have a true sentence means what about it? <clears throat> No, Austin. No. You can have a true thing that nobody's proven yet. Like, I don't know, if I killed a person and buried them in the desert and no one knows it, that could still be true. It's not true, okay? But like hypothetically speaking, things could be true even if no one's found out yet. So, Devin, a sentence is true when what the sentence says matches the facts of reality. Correct, yes. So, take one sentence that says, Dr. Vulich is wearing a watch. It's true. It is true, I'm wearing a watch. So here it is. It's not a false statement. If I said to you that I was wearing um, a scarf right now, that would be a false sentence. That would be a falsehood. It's not true because uh, as you can see, I don't have a scarf on. So what the reality of the objective world is, is what is true or false. A sentence is true when it co corresponds to the actual facts. Um, tell me something that's true. Just anything that's true. Write down a sentence that is a fact. <clears throat> Let's see if you can give me something just to work with as an example in the discussion here. There's all kinds of true things. You don't have to overthink it, but let me hear one of them. <clears throat> Sun rises from the east. Okay, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, Paul, you talk a lot, I mean, I guess People who know you might know this about you. I can see you're very active in the chat, so that's fair enough. Tom Brady is trash. Ah, that's a big opinion. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't like him, and that's fair enough. You know, we all have our different sporting uh, fans and, like, those that we don't like. Um, but he's won a lot of those championships, I guess, seven of them at this point. It's kind of, you know, I thought that the Chiefs would probably win, but I was surprised to see that uh, Mahomes didn't have it. Anyway, yeah, so here's another one. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers just won the Super Bowl. That's true. Um, I'm using YouTube Live. Yeah, I do have a cat. That's also true. Okay. So, and no, I did not kill anybody in the desert. But if I ever did, um, I would not let you know. But I have not done it. Anyway, so good. Um, and Jonah, I guess you and uh, Noah are having a little debate right there. So anyways, yes. Um, true sentences. I just wanted you guys to kind of think about that and give some examples. Now, what is a belief? A belief, it pertains to truth a little bit. But let's go into that. What is it to have a belief in a sentence? Like you believe, I guess, that I killed someone. I didn't do that. But I hope, I hope you don't actually believe that. But anyway, what is it to believe a statement? When a person thinks that a sentence is true, correct. Yeah, so like if you think that, um, you know, aliens built pyramids or something, then the statement that aliens built it, you think that's what really happened. Um, 
Beliefs are up to the individual and their judgment. It depends on what you think is the case, what you think are the facts. Uh, but of course, a belief can be incorrect. You know, there could be a person who believes that I'm um, in my 40s, but I'm not. You know, so a belief can be what you think is true, but in some cases you got the wrong um, information or you didn't process the information correctly. Okay, so very good, guys. Um, after that, I think all that was left from those uh, previous meeting was we talked about um, how there are different types of sentences. So we mentioned that there are assertoric sentences. Those are just sentences that are true or false, that have a truth value. Um, and those are important because those are the only kind of sentences that are used in logical arguments as premises or as conclusions. Now, um, another uh, type of sentence is the interrogative. Okay, if you remember, an interrogative is just a question. So if I ask a person anything or if I ask anything whatsoever, what day is it? Um, who won the Super Bowl? Where's the bathroom? These are just all interrogatives. They're questions. It's if somebody says, um, sit down, um, open the door, take out the trash, whatever. Those would be directives, commands, and those are imperatives. Paul, what you're saying here, it's a team game. Good leaders elevate their team. Okay, so you guys, you're having a more nuanced debate about the, um, the merits of the two contenders in the Super Bowl. But let me see, what is your point? Injuries to the offensive line of the Chiefs contributed to the pressure on Mahomes. Penalties on the Chiefs' defense gave Tom Brady more opportunities to score. Yes, I've heard the, the, the analysis. I did watch most of the game, except for the first quarter where I guess most of the scoring did happen. Anyway, um, middle ground between the arguments. So taking a nuanced view, like I can see the reason to do that. And a lot of times someone has to be the, the moderate that splits the difference between two more opposed polarized positions. But yeah, let's continue with the review. Just a couple more points. Um, we also talked about uh, conclusion and premise indicator words. And I think that's where we kind of ran out of time. So I have a question. What are some conclusion indicator words? These are words that indicate that you've reached to the conclusion now of the argument and we're about to state the conclusion. So there are some very common examples of these words. Who can remember any of them? And let me see in the chat. Okay, very good. Yeah, so one of them, Mateo, is therefore. Um, so in this case, my car is parked on the street, and the car this morning was wet. Therefore, you know, I conclude that it rained last night. So therefore is one of them. There's also so, right? A car is parked on the street. It, this morning it was wet, so it must have rained last night. Um, thus, hence, ergo, consequently. Okay, very good. It follows that. Yes, these are all legitimate examples of conclusion indicator words. Now, just um, to round this out and complete the review, what about premise indicator words? Does anyone know any of these? Um, evidence words, words which mean here's something that is evidence for something else. Uh, so those words include what are some of the most popular ones? Because, given that, since, due to the fact. That's very good. Thank you, Devin. So since and because, I believe, are probably some of the most common everyday used. Um, you know, since I overslept, uh, therefore I missed class. You know, so I missed class is the result coming from this reason. Um, since Jones' uh, blood was found at the crime scene, he must have been present when the crime was committed. You know, so like that's another case where you have some evidence and one draws a conclusion from it. Okay, so very good, guys. Now, um, today, we're going to spend most of all of the meeting focusing on the difference between the two main types of argument and reasoning. So there are two main forms of reasoning and argument in logic, and that's what we call deduction versus induction. So let me give you these notes. <clears throat> Okay, so we have deduction versus induction. Those are two modes of reasoning. And um, we have arguments that are deductive arguments, and we have, on the other hand, arguments that are inductive arguments. So today we're really going to try and make sure to understand what is a deductive argument and what is an inductive argument. That's, that's a major fundamental um, 
stage setting concept or distinction within logic. And so we're going to try and make sure this comes through clearly right at the beginning. Okay, so let me begin then with my analysis and statement of what is deductive argumentation. Okay, so a good deductive argument is what we call deductively valid. Okay, so when you're dealing with a good deductive argument, that's the label that it has, deductively valid argument. Sometimes we abbreviate and just say simply valid argument, but I'm making it very technically precise that if it's valid, it's deductively valid. Okay, so the definition of a, dedu a deductively valid argument is this. It is an argument in which, where if the premises are all true, if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must necessarily also be true. Okay, so here's the definition. If all of the premises are true, then, in that case, the conclusion must also be true. Okay, so I double underline the word must because that's really the most essential um, elements of this definition that you want to hang on to. When you have a deductively valid argument, again, what it means is that in case if the premises are all true, then the conclusion based on those premises has to be true. So with a valid argument, you can never have all the premises true and the conclusion false. That's literally not possible when the argument is valid. So let me just provide you with some reasonable examples of this. Um, all dogs are mammals. Let's say that's the first premise, okay? Second premise, uh, the uh, chihuahua is a dog. So chihuahuas are dogs. I've, I've picked the one that's like the hardest to spell. Should have just gone with terriers or something easier, but, you know, fine. Um, all dogs are mammals. Chihuahuas are dogs. What conclusion do you think could be drawn from those two premises there? Like what logically follows? Hence, therefore, what? If all dogs are mammals and chihuahuas are dogs, then we get to the conclusion that, pretty elementary, that, uh, you know, put those two pieces together and what's the result? Well, it, it is true that all dogs are dogs, correct, Paul, but that would be a tautology. Um, so the valid conclusion here is that chihuahuas are mammals, yes. <clears throat> There we have a deductively valid argument. And let's make sure we are all clear why it's valid. Because <clears throat> assuming all dogs are mammals, and they actually are, but suppose they are, and suppose then you have one uh, species that's a member of the category dogs, or one breed, I should say. So if this is a breed of dogs and all dogs are mammals, then yes, this breed being one of the dog types is also a mammal. And this can be shown as a valid argument through the use of what we are calling Venn diagrams. So maybe some of you have ever used Venn diagrams in earlier studies in math classes or stats classes or something. Um, but look at it like this. So I'm going to draw this circle, and this circle is just going to stand for dogs. So the letter D is there. This is all the dogs. So suppose that it's a set of all dogs. That's this circle, what it stands for. Now. To show that premise one is true, in other words, to visually depict on this diagram that all dogs are mammals, I'm going to draw another circle and I'm going to label it M. And that circle of M is going to stand for all mammals. So how shall I draw that circle in relationship to this one if I'm going to just sort of visualize the diagram which shows that all dogs are mammals? That's my question. Tell me how to draw the M circle to uh, fully well, that's not quite correct, actually, Paul, because that would be saying all mammals are dogs, and that's not true. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
So it's around. It has to surround. It has to subsume D, okay? So that D is a proper part of M. So every dog is a mammal because everything within this circle is a part of the larger set that contains it. Now, are there non-dog mammals? Like, yes, there's human beings, giraffes, tigers, lions, bears, and all these other warm-blooded, um, you know, live birth creatures. So that's why there's a, sh a region that extends beyond D but still is within M. Okay, so one more thing. I'm trying to now show that chihuahuas are dogs. So I'm just going to draw the little letter C, and that's going to stand for the chihuahuas. Where should C be given? Uh, okay, and that's good, Paul. So the circle with C is going to be fully encased within this D. This is all the chihuahuas. Chihuahuas are dogs, every single one of them. If there were some chihuahuas that weren't dogs, then I guess this would extend beyond the perimeter of D. But anyway, every chihuahua is a dog. Every dog is a mammal. So we can see clearly that the conclusion logically follows. Chihuahuas are mammals. This falls within the larger circle um, designated by M as having all mammals. So there's no way to draw these two premises on a graph to show that they are true, where this is somehow false. There's no way to represent visually that these are two true statements, and then somehow C falls outside of the whole scope of M. So in other words, it is a deductively valid argument. If the two premises are true, the conclusion has to be as well. Okay, and so let me just kind of continue to give you various different examples of this. Because I've noticed that as, um, as logical as the concept of deductive validity is, it's one of those definitions and ideas that sometimes it's slippery when you're first learning it, and sometimes people kind of have to hear it a bunch of different ways with a bunch of different examples before it really sinks in. So I'm going to kind of work this a few different ways. Let's look at another example then. Um, so... Um, Costa Mesa is in California. Um, California is in the US. So what is the conclusion that you think follows here? Again, hopefully it's not too tough to, to deduce it. But now make a deduction. What can clearly be um, concluded on the basis of these two premises. <clears throat> Costa Mesa is a part of California. California is a part of the United States. So Costa Mesa is in the United States, yes. Okay, so like here's Costa Mesa. It's part of California. California is a part of the United States. It's one of the states. So obviously it follows, right? The Costa Mesa is part of the U.S. It's part of one of the states, which is part of the U.S. This conclusion has to be true if these two premises are true. So um, just a few different examples of deductively valid arguments. An easy way to generate a deductively valid argument is to present the first premise, which mentions that um, all things within a certain category have a, a given feature. Like if I say that um, all humans were born on the planet Earth. It's an all statement, and it mentions a feature of everything that's a human being, like every human was born on this planet. The second premise would then, in certain cases, mention an individual who's a member of the given category. So you could say, like, Michael Jordan is a human being. And in that case, you would notice the conclusion that follows, that has to follow from them, is that he was born on the planet Earth. So if you have, like, a generalized statement, uh, an all statement, a universal generalization, and then you can supply an example of a member of that category, then it would follow that they have whatever additional property members of that category have to have. Another example could be with the use of words like no, which is also categorical. Um, so like if I write out this statement, no woman has been president Um, <clears throat> Oprah is a woman. No woman's been president. Oprah is a woman. Um, we can, I think, 
derive the conclusion here, what would be that conclusion in this case? <clears throat> There's never been a woman U.S. president, true. Oprah is a woman, also true. So from these two statements, one thing that we can say that logically follows is that she has not been president. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, in this case, what would our diagram look like? Well, this could be the set of all presidents. Over here, we have all the set of women. They're disjoint, they don't intersect, they don't overlap because there's not a member of both. There's no president that's been a woman, there's no woman that's been a president. So they're isolated and separated. Oprah is a woman, one member of the class woman. And you can just see here visually, you know that she's not been president because she's a member of a class that is completely um, discontinuous with a different class over here, standing for those that have been presidents. So it's just another deductively valid argument. Okay. Um, we could go on and on and on pretty much forever, and there's infinitely many variations on the same definition of deductive validity. Um, all human beings have two parents. Tom Brady is a human being. Even it's just another deductively valid argument. So hopefully that's making some decent sense. Maybe I'll throw one more out at you, okay? <clears throat> okay, so... Trying to think here of a good example, all right? Then, okay, here we go. Okay, two premises. One, the first one says that Tom Brady is older than Dr. Vulich, which is true. The second one says that Dr. Vulich is older than Anthony Davis, also true. Now, something follows from these two statements. It's not too hard to deduce, but you'll let me know. What's the valid conclusion of this argument? That Tom Brady is older than Anthony Davis, yes. Okay, and that's just because of the transitivity of the greater than relation. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then A is greater than C for any three um, quantitative values, A, B, and C. So when it's age, if his age is a larger number than my age, and my age is a larger number than his age, then of course it must be the case that he's older than AD. And we could run the same kind of uh, valid argument with any kind of quantitative measure where there's greater than or less than, like it could be about height. Uh, LeBron James is taller than me. I am taller than, uh, I'm just thinking of somebody short, maybe uh, Kevin Hart. So therefore LeBron James is taller than Kevin Hart. That would have to be a true conclusion if the two premises are true. Because I mean, if you have this, LeBron, and you have this, Dr. Bullish, and then there's Kevin Hart over here, who's pretty short then obviously him being taller than me, me being taller than him, there's no way that it could not be true that he is taller than the third member of the, of the set. Okay, so I've just spoken of what is the definition of deductive validity. It's an argument where if the premises are true, then the conclusion has to be, not just might be, but has to be true as well. And um, these have just been a couple of different examples of arguments which, which have that form. Now, the next thing to go over is what it is for an argument to be sound. So this is another uh, term that applies to deductive arguments. Um, validity is one property that a, deductively val that a deductive argument can have, but soundness is another one, and soundness is a little bit of a different definition. So here, let me put the definition on the board, and we'll talk about it. So soundness. What does it take for a deductive argument to be sound? Okay, two things. Number one, it has to be a valid argument, okay? And then there has to be something extra on top of that. So a soundness, um, a deductively valid argument
with all true premises. So that's key. Sound. A sound argument, an argument that has soundness, is a valid argument, but also beyond that fact, it has got true premises, and every premise is true. So for you to fully comprehend this, you have to know that there can be, and sometimes there are, valid arguments that are not sound. Okay, so a valid argument is sometimes unsound. In other cases, it is sound. And I'm going to try and now expose the difference between those two with further examples. Okay, now, Paul, what you're saying is this. So an extra premise that was incorrect, but if the remaining premises still support the conclusion, it was valid but not sound. Um, yeah, basically. So you can have an argument where at least one premise is false, but the conclusion still follows from those premises if, hypothetically, they were true. So in that case, yes, it would be valid but not sound. It's, I think, easier to comprehend with the example. So let me give you a quick example, okay? Hmm. All human beings have walked on Mars. Okay, um, let's say uh, Tom Brady is a human being. Okay, now I'm asking, can you deduce the logical conclusion of this um, strange argument, which says first that all humans have walked on Mars, and then that Tom Brady is a human. So from those two statements, what is the just logical consequence? The information sentence that follows from these two other pieces of information would be what statement? <clears throat> All humans have walked on Mars. He's a human. So, good then, Preston, that Tom Brady, therefore, has, has walked on Mars. Okay, so. Yeah, no, but that's... Uh, that's good, right? Noah, so you've got the right answer, too. Tom Brady's walked on Mars. Amber, uh, okay, yeah, I see that you're correcting your spelling. Yeah, so look at this argument now. Question for you guys, okay? First of all, is this argument valid, yes or no? What do you think? That's a yes or no question. So question, valid, yay or nay? So, Preston, you're saying no, and Prue, you're also saying no. Kayla, you're saying yes. So, um, we don't all have this, we're not all on the same page just yet, but we'll get there. And let me tell you right now, the fact is, this is valid. This is a valid argument. It's 100% valid. Why? Well, because validity does not mean the premises are true. It just means that if they were true, right, you have to think hypothetically. You have to think about the scenario, hypothetically, where the premises are true. And then you have to question whether in that scenario, just on the basis of an assumption, would this have to follow? And it does. So just logically speaking, this conclusion does result from these two pieces of information above. With validity, we're not really evaluating whether anything in there is true or false. We're just asking this other question. Does the conclusion logically follow from the premises? And in this case, it does. This conclusion is the logical result of the two premises given here. But, and now this is the distinction I wanted to try and make sure we're getting clear on. Although it's valid, uh, and Preston, I see you've already said this above, but to the rest of us, uh, let's try and be on the same page. It's valid, but it's not what? What do you think I'm trying to uh, gesture towards here? Although it's a valid argument, now we're developing our terminology. It's not what other thing. It's valid, but not what. Good, exactly. It's not sound. And now that you've learned the definition of the word sound, tell me then, be precise, why isn't it sound? 
What is throwing this argument off from being sound? What information or part of the argument, um, you know, negates it from being sound? Because there's a specific reason, and it's not too hard to point out. If it's a sound argument, every premise has to be true. And of course, good Noah, premise one is not true. Premise two is true, so let's not be overstating it, Kayla and Devin. You say premises. Well, Tom Brady is a human being, and that's one of the premises, which is which is true. But um, overall, though, if it's a sound argument, every premise has to be true, every single one. And in this case, number one clearly is false. Have you walked on Mars? No, you haven't. And we know that so far in history, nobody has done that. No human being has done that. So we have a false premise, but on the assumption of its truth and on the assumption of the second premise's truth, the conclusion does result from those uh, premises. I see maybe choosing Tom Brady as the example, uh, you know, leads to all the humorous asides about whether he's really a human or not. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I see you're funny, uh, your, your, your comments there. Um, so yeah, let me show you a little diagram just to make it very abundantly clear that this is a valid argument. Say that we have a circle which stands for all human beings, and so that's here, human beings. If all of them have walked on Mars, then this would be the diagram to look at. Every human being falls within the broader circle of M, things that have walked on Mars. I don't know, are there Martians and other aliens that have done it? Well, all of us have on this first premises claim. Tom Brady is a human being. Here he is, he's one of us, one of those humans. So according to the statements anyway, the conclusion does have to be true. Um, so it checks out on the criteria of validity because the conclusion is just a logical consequence of the premises and that's all that validity by itself requires. But to have that additional um, virtue of being sound, the premises would have to all be really facts like in the real world. And so it's valid but not sound. Let me just state that clearly. Okay, so I'm just returning to your commentary here. Uh, Tom Brady's godlike with that flat football, maybe, or on a flat earth. Okay, the debate rages on, doesn't it? Um, personally, I mean, on my own opinions of Brady, I'm not a huge fan of him, the person. I guess as an athlete, though, he's he's earned my grudging respect after 10 Super Bowl appearances. But, uh, but yeah, you know, who's to say? Okay, so, Amber. There won't be an invalid premise. It's a poorly formed question you're asking because premises are either true or false. The, the word validity applies to whole arguments, not just one sentence within the argument. So um, if you could re-ask the question, um, what is that question? Are you saying for it to be sound, every premise has to be true? Yes, if it's sound, every premise is true. This argument is valid, but it's not sound. It's not sound because premise one is not correct to the facts of reality. But it's valid because the conclusion still follows from these premises. With validity, disregard whether any of this is true or not. And just ask yourself, does this information come from the information above? If so, it's valid without further consideration. But to question whether it's sound or not, you have to compare the premises to objective reality and ask whether they're really true or not. Noah, is the argument not valid with premises that do not draw any conclusion? Um, well, if you have an argument where the premises don't establish the conclusion, then it's invalid. Let me give you some examples there. <clears throat> Look at this argument, okay? Some men have long hair. Dr. Gulich is a man. So, therefore, Dr. Gulich has long hair. Question, valid or invalid? Is this argument valid or is it invalid? No, Amber, no. You say as long as there are two or more premises, then the argument is considered valid? No. It's valid or not, depending on whether the conclusion logically follows from the premises. It's valid if it is not possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false. It's valid if, assuming the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Now, this is invalid, 
Okay, good. This is not valid. Why isn't it valid? Because this conclusion doesn't follow from these premises. Okay, suppose that I say some men have long hair, and they do. So here's men, all the men. Some of them have long hair. So here's the long hairs. Some of them are men, the overlapping section of the two circles in the diagram. So suppose I'm Dr. Vulich, a man, and here I am. Does it follow that I have to have long hair? No, because the first premise does not say all men have long hair. It says some do. So this is not valid. The conclusion can be false, even if both of the premises are true. And in fact, that is exactly the case. Both of these are true statements, and this is false. So it's an invalid argument because that's even possible. If you have a valid argument, you can't even imagine a situation of having both premises or all premises being true and the conclusion being false. So this is invalid. <clears throat> now, you can also have an invalid argument where all the information in it is true. Okay, so like here, let me give you this. <clears throat> So let that just be our premise statement. Dr. Foolish was born in California. And then suppose the conclusion just says, Dr. Foolish is a professor. Okay, let's ask, is this valid or not valid, this argument that you're looking at now? Valid or no? It's invalid, yes. Everything's true, but it's not a valid argument. That's also correct, Paul. Now, uh, one thing I have to say, though, Paul, a slight correction. You say everything is true and sound. I know why you're saying that, because all the statements are true. But soundness technically only exists when it's valid also and the premises are all true. So because this is invalid, that is one of the two criteria for soundness that doesn't get checked off in this case. So soundness is validity plus. Validity plus facts are all the premises. And this is unsound, not because the premises are false, but because it's invalid. Now let's go over why it's not valid. You say, Khan, no support. Well, this is the support for the conclusion, but it's bad support, why? You say no and no evidence, also not quite correct. This is the evidence that is given by the argument for this conclusion. So why is it an invalid argument? It's invalid, yes, but tell me why. Because it does not follow from the premises. That's a good way to put it, Prue. Um, this statement is a fact, but it does not follow from me being born in California. In other words, the fact, even though it's true that I was born in California, does not logically imply that I would become a professor, even though I did. All of you guys, most of you anyway, were also born in California, and I know that none of you, at least right now, are professors. So this fact does not establish this fact. Therefore, even though the statements are both true, it's an invalid argument. Or, if you want to think about it slightly differently, we can clearly imagine a possible universe where this is true and this is false. Since you can imagine such a universe, the argument is not valid. With a valid argument, it's not even conceivable for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. But here, that is easy to conceive of, okay? Just imagine that my life played out differently, that I was a person born in California, and I just chose to do something else with my life, maybe become a Tetris gamer uh, professionally or you know, a professional musician or maybe even an athlete, uh, maybe not even finish college and just travel the world or something. I don't know. I chose to be a professor, but this is not something that was the logical byproduct of me being born in California. Okay. Um, Paul, you see, when I moved out here 20 years ago, the saying was no one is from California. Well, yeah. Fair enough. A lot of people that are in Southern California, especially Los Angeles, come here from all around the country. Um, but anyway, you guys understand what I'm talking about. So yeah, me being born in California doesn't establish the fact that I'm a professor. So it's an invalid argument, even though, even though these are all true statements. Okay. So just understand that an, a valid argument can have a bunch of false premises. In that case, it just wouldn't be sound. You can also have an invalid argument where all the premises are true if they don't imply the conclusion. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I'll just repeat it if I did. When you studied math and stuff in your early 
you know, elementary school days, and you learn how to do basic sums like this, two plus two is four, the visual that you have is much similar to the way that a logical argument looks in standard form. The result of the above is placed below this line. And this is just what has to be the case if this mathematical operation involving the terms above happens. So with a logical argument, you know, you have to have a conclusion that is the result that follows from the above information. And if that is the case, then it's valid, period. Um, soundness, though, does require estimation of the facts of the world and how they compare to the information of the premises. Paul, you say all dogs are mammals. Terriers are dogs. And therefore, all dogs are... Wait. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at your argument. It's hard to read it out. What is the conclusion? Conclusion, terriers are mammals. So all dogs are mammals. All dogs are male. The male statement, though, um, is the conclusion that you're using. So let me, let me try and write out what you're writing here. All dogs are mammals. Okay. Uh, yeah, three is not at all related to the other things. But all dogs are mammals. Terriers are dogs. You understand, right, that the conclusion of this would be that terriers are mammals. Yes. So I'm just going on your own example, Paul, but here. Um, oh, well, let me see your, let me pay attention to what you're saying here. Conclusion, terriers are mammals. Three was unnecessary. Um, okay, interesting question that you're asking. What if there is a piece of information listed in the premises that is not related to the valid conclusion? Well, as long as it doesn't contradict the conclusion, it could be put there, but it would be unnecessary to mention. You know, that would be like an extraneous point within an argument. Suppose that I say this to somebody, and I'm an investigator. I'm trying to make the case that Jones is the culprit of the murder. So I say here to the jury, presenting my argument to the jury, look, jurors and judge and everybody watching, Jones is the killer. I'll tell you why. When the forensic investigators went to the crime scene, they found fabric from his clothes that he's known to possess all over the crime scene, plus his DNA was found at the crime scene. Also... Um, it's a nice sunny day today. Therefore, he's the murderer. Now, the other information given implies his guilt, at least reasonably so. Um, the fact that it's a nice sunny day when he makes the argument, if, even if that's one of the premises, it kind of – it doesn't necessarily weaken the argument, but it's unnecessary information that's unrelated to the conclusion that you're drawing. So in an ordinary context, it would be weird and awkward to bring in irrelevant information as one of your premises. But it doesn't technically render the argument invalid as long as it doesn't contradict the link between the other premises and the conclusion that you do write. Okay? Um, so good. Hopefully that answers your question. And now you're writing, how does that affect the valid sound definition? Oh, no, but that was before I gave the summary. So now we're all on the same page. Good. Um, like if I say all dogs are mammals, like your own example, all dogs are mammals, terriers are dogs. Um, I own a cat, therefore terriers are mammals. You know, the third premise is completely out of place, but it's not necessarily that it makes the argument invalid. It just makes the argument a little bit lengthier and less elegant uh, than it could have been. Yeah, it might impact your credibility speaking to someone. They might be like, why are they citing pieces of info that don't really relate to their claim? Um, so you could be criticized for that. And that's probably why you wouldn't do it in real life. But just being formal and speaking about definitions, that would not by itself defeat the, val the validity of the argument. Okay. Yeah, so it, it would just be a sort of um, an issue of how you want to appear when you make the argument. You want to be taken seriously. Um, so if you take in and present irrelevant information, the person might think, well, you have a pretty good ability to reason, but you also have a questionable sense of relevance. Um, so that would be, I guess, what I could say in reply to that. Okay, guys. Well, it's good all around so far. I think we're making some nice progress. We're learning what's validity, what is soundness, what's the difference between these two different concepts. But they both fall within the realm of deduction. Um, okay. Let's see. So, I don't know. Um, next, I guess, we'll talk about the other side of this type of distinction, induction. What are good inductive arguments? Um, yeah, sound does require validity, that's true. 
Okay, so now let's switch over to the other main type of argument. I said we're doing deduction and induction. So now we've learned all about deduction. What is validity? What is soundness? On the other hand, though, we also have inductive arguments. And when you have inductive arguments, a good inductive argument, the label, the terminology is not valid. It's rather strong. Okay, so inductively strong argument. Let me give you the definition. Okay, now with an inductively strong argument, here's the idea. It's, it's an argument where if all the premises are true, then the conclusion is likely to be true. Not guaranteed, not that it must be. That's the difference between deduction and induction. With deductive validity, the truth of the premises absolutely guarantees that the conclusion must be true. With inductive strength, the truth of the premises only supports the probability, the high likelihood of the conclusion. But with every inductive argument, no matter how strong, there's a little wiggle room for the possibility, at least, that the conclusion could turn out to be false, even though all the premises are true. So here I'll define it for you. Um, if all the premises are true, then in that case, the conclusion is highly likely to be true. Probably is true. But can't be guaranteed 100%. So if all the premises is true, then conclusion highly likely to be true. OK. So um, there's many, many examples of inductively strong arguments. I guess I'll begin with some that are textbook examples that are often used by professors in this type of uh, setting, OK? Yeah, and you would avoid categorical assertions. Absolutely correct, Paul. Uh, because those are the kind that don't leave room for exceptions to the case. Like if I say all dogs are mammals, um, and then I say a terrier is a dog, it's not like, well, maybe it's a mammal, because I said all, not just most. But in induction arguments, we don't get that. So here's like one classic case. Take this to be our premise. The sun, you know, the sun shining down. The sun has come up, has, has arisen every morning, for a long time, uh, so, I mean, it's not even a year, 10 years, 100 years. We're talking billions of years because of the whole span of the Earth's existence. It's been in um, orbit around uh, the sun as a central point within our solar system. So the sun has come up every morning for literally billions of years. That's a long track record in history. <clears throat> So what might be a conclusion that is a safe conclusion to draw based on this um, premise? It seems probable, highly likely, that what? If the sun has come up every morning for billions of years, um, Paul will get to that, but I'm asking this question really quick about what conclusion could easily follow from this, that the sun will come up tomorrow, did no one? Tomorrow, just kind of abbreviating there. That's an inductively strong argument. So let's think about what it's saying. Um, do you think the sun will come up tomorrow? I hope so. I mean, it would be kind of depressing if you thought this is it. This is the last day, and then tomorrow it's not going to happen anymore. Um, so you believe it will come up, but it's not for no reason. It's not like you're just it's a hunch. I think maybe it's based on a very extensive uh, prior record of the sun's performance going back millions, billions, just geologic time scales here. So if it's been doing that every morning for billions and billions of years, one would assume pretty reasonably that it'll do it again tomorrow, that this pattern will continue to uh, persist, at least into another case. Um, but here's the thing. Can we absolutely guarantee 100% that it will come up tomorrow? I mean, no. At a certain point, the sun, of course, exhausts its fuel supply, and then it explodes into a supernova, and at that point, there won't even be a sun, and we'll just all be engulfed in the explosive uh, outburst of its you know, material getting ejected out into space. We think that's not going to happen for billions of years, 
But uh, we can't say that it won't happen tomorrow. I mean, what if a giant celestial event, like a huge asteroid, collided with the sun, breaking it apart? Or what if the Earth got struck by a giant massive object passing through space, and therefore there is no Earth from which to observe the sunrise or whatever? So we don't think those things are going to happen overnight because they have not happened for so long. And so when you have a pretty long pattern in time, it becomes pretty reasonable to assume that it's going to continue to go on. But unlike a deductive argument, this conclusion remains possibly false, at least to some small possible degree. Okay? So let me see what you've said here in our comments. Um, the sun coming up. The sun's really old. It'll come up again. Facts. Paul, you're saying the Earth's been rotating for billions of years. Another example. So we will rotate tomorrow. Sure. Yeah, that would be another fair example of this. Um, and we're all going to freeze to death tomorrow. That would be depressing. Certainly, yes. Um, would it be also lit and depressing? I mean, maybe, you know, if you're a nihilist, then you could sort of see both. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's an inductively strong argument. Now, from this kind of base, we can spin off any number of different examples. True enough, Paul, we all know that we remain stationary as the sun. Sorry, we're. I mean, we're rotating around the Earth and tilting on our axis. So the appearance of sunrise is because of our axis tilt as we you know rotate around it in orbit but i'm just borrowing from common speech that people use it rises in the east sets in the west you know yeah so um no it's fair it's all fair okay so i'm just saying now we can generalize from this example to other various examples of deductive uh, sorry inductively strong arguments um take athletic performance has tom brady made the playoffs every year for 21 years i'm not sure I know he's made the Super Bowl 10 times, and I think that even in the years where he didn't make the you know, Super Bowl, he was still qualified for the playoffs. So anyway, suppose that you have an athlete like that. He's made the playoffs every year for 20 seasons. So then you conclude, therefore, he'll make the playoffs again next year. Now, can we guarantee that he will make the playoffs next year? No, but if you have a performer who's done that well for so long, it seems reasonable to assume that the pattern will continue on another case. Um, let's see. When you get in your car and you turn the key and you, you know, what do you think is going to happen? That the engine will start. Well, why do you believe that? Probably because even if you don't articulate it to yourself, you have some kind of informal reasoning in the background like this. I've owned this car for five years or however long you've owned it. Never once has the engine failed to start. So today when I put the key in there, it will start. But we all know that mechanical failures, etc., can happen and they can unexpectedly disrupt your uh, assumed conclusion in an inductive argument. So we have to rely on induction because we have to gain some kind of reasonable sense of how things will be based on patterns that we've already seen established by the past. But with induction, unlike with deduction, they only take us as far as the high likelihood of the conclusion, and they cannot absolutely guarantee the conclusion, even on the assumption that the premises are true. Um, yeah, and so you're talking about Aristotle here, um, Aristotle's time the understanding that they had of the relative position of the sun and the other planets. Yes, correct. It wasn't until um, Galileo, really, and we're going to talk about Nicholas Copernicus using newly invented telescopes in the um, late medieval, early Renaissance period. They were able to verify that we orbit the sun. It was actually the church that held back this um, understanding in the pattern in the period of time where Galileo and Copernicus were doing their work. They were persecuted for saying this because it was considered unorthodox why would God have put the planet Earth not in the middle if he created man in his image and the whole universe is here just for our species to inhabit? Anyways, though, that's a bit of a digression. Um, I hope we understand, then, the sort of format of inductively strong arguments. I can give you many others. Me, I've never, I've never broken a bone so far in my life. And that's, I'm in my 30s. So, you know, if I say I've never broken a bone in over 30 years, so I won't break a bone today... That seems probably pretty reasonable for me to conclude, but you know anything can happen on a given day and the pattern could be disrupted. Let me give you more examples, right? How about uh, history? The United States in over 200 years has never elected a woman president. So every president has been a man for over 200 years. One might conclude based on that, that the next US president will be another man. Can we say that's certain? No. I mean, we've had viable woman candidates, and I guess Hillary Clinton made the closest approach of a woman to successfully capture the White House. So 
you know, it doesn't seem like it's impossible, but when 20, 200 years of history are there, it seems like you got this inductive pattern. Nonetheless, an inductive conclusion can sometimes turn out false, even with that pattern in the past. I can think of like, we're talking about presidents. Prior to the election of Obama, um, every US president had been a white man. So you could have said in over 200 plus years of US history, um, every president has been white, so the next president will be white. But of course, Obama broke that longstanding pattern in history. So it just is a reminder that with induction, we have a pretty reasonable conclusion that we draw from some set of evidence that goes back. Um, and the conclusion of induction is always that the same pattern will continue in the next observed instance. But as I've mentioned over and over, with induction, it's still possible for the conclusion to turn out uh, otherwise. And that's the difference between deduction and induction. Deduction, the conclusion must be true if the premises are. Induction, conclusion is probably true with, if the premises are. Now here's some more commentary. Olympic Games are held in, uh, by elected countries every four years. Yes, Amber, good. You could say that going back hundreds of years, we've had an Olympics every four seasons, every four years. So we'll have one next year. If we had said that in 2019, though, we would have been wrong, right? Because the pandemic pushed it all out to now this year. Um, so um, that's a good example of a pattern in history that we would assume continues, but uh, unexpected things can sometimes throw off the conclusion of your induction. Um, and we do have a woman vice president, correct? Fair enough, Ian. Who knows? Um, it, she may ascend to the presidency at some point in the future. Um, anyways, good. So uh, I like all the examples you've given. We've had a peaceful transition of power every four years from the beginning of the United States until uh, 2016. So we'll have another one in 2020. But of course, that didn't exactly happen given the whole capital riots scenario. So yeah, I hope you guys understand inductive strength. There can also be inductively weak arguments though too, okay? Like there can be arguments that are inductive, but the conclusion isn't even very plausible, even though the premises are true. So like say that someone argues, um, I found $5 while I was just going on a walk yesterday in, in my neighborhood. So if I go on a walk today, I'll find another $5. Is that really a strong inductive argument? No, because in this case, unlike the others I've played with here, the premise is just a one-off random occurrence with no very likelihood of repeating. If you guys ever find money on the street, $5 or more, you know you know that it's a pretty rare occasion because people hold on their money, they don't usually drop it on the ground. So if you found one, you'd be lucky and there'd be no particular reason to assume it's gonna keep happening. But if you do find $5 on the street every day for like a year, then that would be a different case. And then I guess you could have an inductively based argument that you'll find one tomorrow. I mean, in that case, I don't know who's dropping the money for you to find, but it's a hypothetical scenario. Okay, so yeah, um, all around, I'm just giving you guys new information. What is deduction? What is induction? What's a deductively strong argument? Sorry, what is a deductively valid argument and a deductively sound argument? And then what's an inductively strong argument and an inductively weak argument? So um, let me hear from you guys if you've got some uh, contributions here. I've seen some in the comments and I kind of wanted to come back to them, but now let's let's do this. What do you think could be an example of a deductively valid argument? Let's try that first. No, come on. I mean, that's the president. Let's have a little respect for the man who won the office. You know, but at the same time, he is the oldest president of all time. So the age jokes, I guess, are sometimes funny. But we're all gonna get there eventually, my friend. You know, what about when you're up there? Just saying. Anyways, yeah. Um, nonetheless, a deductively valid argument. What do you think? <clears throat> Just give me an example. You can write it as so. Just you can number the premises one, two, and then state the conclusion. Um, I know it'll be hard to write in standard form given the limitations of the chat interface. Here, Paul, you say, well, that's not an example yet. Oh, come on, Noah. You don't want that, right? I mean, you want to live. But let's be serious. What's a deductively valid argument? Okay, well, you just wrote the number one, though, Preston. I need more than that. Amber, I'm sorry. I'm confused. I said, I said deductively valid. Deductively valid. So we've done induction for a while. I'm going to step back to the other definition and ask someone if they can. Try and create right now a deductively valid argument. Now, here's some hints. You can use words like all or no um, in order to state the first premise, and that sometimes helps you get going. 
but let's see what you've got. Trevor, you say the ocean contains salt. True. Where are you going from there? Humans can taste salt. Usually they can, and that's fair enough, yeah. Some people have COVID, I guess. They can't taste anything. But anyway, so humans can taste the salt in the ocean. Yeah, I guess that would make sense. Um, it's a bit of an odd presentation of argument, but it makes sense. The ocean does contain salt. Since it has it, humans can taste it, and therefore humans can taste the salt in the ocean. The only thing I would say about your example, though, Trevor, is that the second premise and the conclusion are suspiciously very similar. I mean, it sounds like humans can taste salt. Therefore, humans can really taste that salt wherever it is. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a good example. Let me see, Noah. Bleach is harmful to humans. I'm going to ingest bleach. Therefore, my body will be harmed. Okay, great. Now, that's valid, but I hope it's not sound, right? Um, because I hope it means, even though you're giving me a valid argument, the second premise, which says you're going to ingest bleach, I would hope you would never do that in reality. So it's sound. Sorry, it's valid, but not sound. Okay, Ian. Um, planets are round. Earth is a planet. And I'm sure that you're going to say that it's, therefore... Hit me with the conclusion. <clears throat> or is that it? Now you gotta have one more statement in there. <clears throat> or not, I mean, uh, yes, correct, thanks. Ian. So planets are round, all planets are round, I think. Uh, then you say the Earth is a planet, yes. So the Earth is round, that's valid, and it's sound. Um, let me look at Amber's example. Human beings need water. Do they, though? I mean, couldn't they just drink soda all day, technically? But, yeah, it's got water content. Anyway, humans need water. Sorry, mammals need water is what you said. Actually, you have two cases, so I'm not sure which one to start with, but I'll start with the one below. Well, you've done three. It's humans, mammals, back to – mammals, humans, back to mammals. Anyway, though, uh, I'll riff on one of them. Human, mammals need water, humans are mammals, and therefore humans need water. I get it. Mammals need water, we are mammals, so we need water too. That's perfectly good, and that's valid and uh, sound. Okay. Yeah, not to worry, Amber. We got it all out there. So these are all good examples, just hoping you guys can kind of work with the idea. Now help me with some inductive cases. What do you think could be an example of an inductively strong argument? Noah, uh, let me look at your example that I'm, you just wrote. Water, H2O that is, is a necessity to humans. Okay, say so you're thirsty, that you're going to ingest water, and therefore your body will not be dehydrated. Well, you know, uh, all these pieces of information are more or less true, but the way that they are linked together is a little bit not as tight as it could be. Because you say it's a necessity, um, but something being a necessity doesn't necessarily mean that uh, any quantity of intake is going to fix your dehydration. You know, say that you're like severely dehydrated and you just have like a couple of drops of water out of a thimble, then you'd still be dehydrated in that case. And I only mention this, I'm not trying to be nitpicky, but as a logic teacher, when you're going for a valid argument, you can't leave any room, you can't leave any room for an interpretation even of the premises that allows wiggle room for the conclusion to be false. Okay. Um, but I understand you know, what you're working on and the, the basic gist of your argument. And that does make sense. Um, yeah, so back to another question, though. Let's go into induction land one more time, guys. So who can throw out an inductively strong argument? Let's see one of those. <clears throat> yeah, and don't worry about the typing and keyboard issues. It's all, it's all fair. Um, inductive strength. Okay, Ian. Is this the inductive one? Let's see. It's already, it's, it's, it's off on a weird foot. Evolution is an ongoing process, but where are you gonna go with this? Um, or anyone else, please, you know, supply us with some examples. You say evolution is an ongoing process, and then from there, um, animals will continue to evolve. Okay, well, it's a little bit underspecified. What you could have said is something like, the process of evolution has generated new life forms and new adaptations for billions of years. So the process of evolution will continue to do this tomorrow or something. Um, one issue is that if you don't specify the time frame that the pattern will continue to happen, then it might make the argument a little less specific. Like if I say um, people have always drank water, so people will always drink water, always speaks of the full span of time into the full future. 
it's good to sometimes make the argument a little more reserved and just speak about the next instance of something, like the next case. So if I say that John has come to school every day and never missed a day for being sick all through K-12, then a better conclusion uh, would be to say he won't miss school tomorrow instead of saying so he'll never miss school again because that takes the inductive conclusion and extends it to further cases than just one more. Um, okay, so more examples in the chat. Uh, Prue, an apple a day makes the doctor go away. I eat an apple a day, therefore I still might get sick any time. Nah, this is not a good one though, at all because first of all, it doesn't really look like it's inductive um, because what you say is categorical. Every apple makes the doctor go away when you eat it. And so I eat an apple every day. The conclusion you wrote, it totally contradicts the premises. Why would you still get sick if the premises say apples make the doctor go away and you're eating them? I'm a bit confused as to this, but maybe you're just trying to give an example where the conclusion is false even though the premises are true. Inductively strong arguments aren't that though. The conclusion is likely to be true if the premises are true. So you should have given a conclusion where like I'm not going to get sick or something. But anyway, Devin, Dr. Vulich has a prescription for glasses. Dr. Vulich owns glasses, and therefore Dr. Vulich wears his glasses. Mm, no, I don't have to wear glasses, even if I have a prescription and even if I own them. And in fact, I don't wear these glasses at all, except when I'm teaching. I don't really need them. Um, so, you know, you would not, you could not conclude that um, I wear glasses just because I have a prescription and I own them. I could be a person who likes to have them, but just chooses to not wear them. So that does not follow logically from the premises. Amber. Tom, just random character name, arrives at the gym at eight for five years. I like this kind of example. You're talking about a pattern observed in the past, and then the conclusion is that it continues next time. So if he's come at the gym, uh, if he's arrived to the gym 8 a.m. every day for five straight years, let's assume he'll probably make it there again tomorrow. Good. Now, Mateo, funny example. I've never died in the past, so I will not die ever. See, this is what I was saying. It's better to just state it in a more limited time frame. So if you say... Um, I've never died on any day of my life in 20 years, however old you are, so I won't die today. That is inductively strong. You know, if you've made it this far, it seems like it's going to continue for at least another day. But as we know in life, uh, nothing is absolutely guaranteed when it comes to life and death. So it's inductive, not deductive. Um, okay, Paul, I'm generally healthy. So if I keep doing what I've been doing, I'll probably continue to be healthy. More information could be given, Paul, to make this a little bit of a cleaner argument. You could say like your number of years that you've been healthy with no exceptions. And then, you know, you could also indicate in what future time frame you expect to remain healthy. Like I'll be healthy tomorrow. I'll be healthy this week. If you say I'll be healthy for the whole rest of my life, again, that's too open-ended. And we know that conditions change, especially as you get older. Um, Jake, football teams want to win games, you win games by scoring the most points. One team will try to score more points than the other team. Okay, so that's the conclusion. Um, football teams do want to win games, fair enough. You want to win games by scoring the most points, also true. And therefore, since they want to win and that's how you win, one team will try to score more points than the other team. Okay, are you calling this inductively strong or deductively valid? I suppose I would say that it's inductively strong because you could have a team that is not motivated to score more points. Maybe they're depressed or they just are trying to throw the game. They're kind of trying to cheat and bet on their own loss. Um, but for the most part, you would assume, no, if they typically try to win, then this team will try to win. Um, okay. But you do state the first premise categorically, which is one issue where it could be a little picked apart. You know, you say football teams want to win games, like all of them do. That creates no room for exceptions. So maybe if it's inductive, you should have said most of them want to win, or I don't know. Trevor, I have trees in my backyard. The trees have been there for years, so they'll be there tomorrow. Okay, good, right? Reminds me of something that happened to me, actually. I have a bike. Or I had a bike. And I would leave the bike out on my balcony because um, I thought it's secure. Eventually, somebody just came and stole it because I didn't have it locked up. I had that bike for 15 years, classic Schwinn from the 1970s, the old fixed gear, heavy frame. I loved that bike, and it did get stolen off my own property. So, you know, when I saw it gone, I was thinking inductively, like in 15 years, leaving that bike there, no one stole it. So I thought they wouldn't steal it today. But that just shows you that sometimes when you rely on induction as much as we have to, um, you can still be surprised, and sometimes you have to think about the possibility of the conclusion not turning out to be true. Okay, um, Jim takes mushrooms with the same environmental factors every Saturday. He's had a good trip every time, so he'll have another good trip on Saturday, sure. If this person's never had a bad trip on mushrooms and they keep doing them, maybe that will continue to happen. But again, it can't be guaranteed. Um, 
So, blah, 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 blah. Not the New York Jets. Haha. <laughs> Game 16, Chiefs rested most of their starters because they clinched the first seed already. Not quite playing to win. Okay, that's unrelated commentary on uh, a team's effort level when they already thought they would lose. Yeah, so anyway, I'm happy with our discussion for today. Um, today, what we wanted to do is just learn about deduction versus induction. What's deductive validity, soundness, um, what is inductive strength, and a bunch of examples of both. On Thursday, when we return again, we'll start to drill into deductive argument even more by learning what are four forms of deductively valid argument. So that'll be the main lesson on Thursday. And I'll also assign the first homework assignment on Thursday, which will be due a week after that next week on Thursday. And so you'll get details and uh, clear instructions um, through Canvas and also in the class meeting on Thursday. So anyways, I guess I'll let you guys go. We have a few minutes until 2.10, but I think uh, that's all the that's all the info I had planned for us today. So it's all uh, it's all in there. Anyway, if you need anything between now and then, let me uh, know through email. Other than that, just have a good one. And I hope you guys are having a good week so far. Um, yeah, I never broke a bone. Yeah, well, I mean, I didn't skate a lot as much as all my friends did and stuff. I was never too good at it, so I guess that kind of spared me a little bit. Um, to be honest, I might have had a small stress fracture in the uh, the right ankle one time from running, but I never went to the doctor, and I just kind of dealt with the pain for a few months. I was limping pretty bad. Um, you say, do you have to do the reading in the textbook? Yes. So the first uh, assigned reading from the, ba the pages in the book is listed in the syllabus for Thursday. So, yeah, try to read those pages um, – prior to the Thursday meeting. And for each class meeting, look at the syllabus and try to read the pages assigned to that date before we come into class. Um, all right, everybody. So I think, I think we're in pretty good shape. So I'll see you guys then uh, next time on Thursday. For now, have a good one and um, take it easy and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.